And in tonight's cover story, a reappraisal of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. WGN's Mike Lowe sitting down with the Chicago-based author of the acclaimed biography, King, A Life, to reveal the flawed human who became a civil rights hero. When a man becomes a monument, his legend is forever remembered, but his life is often forgotten. And so it is with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose name is enshrined on 1,000 streets, 100 schools, and one national holiday. This is the great irony of the King holiday and Black History Month. Um, I think they're hugely important, but they run the risk of turning King into a cartoon character or a cardboard cutout. And we need to remember that he's a person. There's a magic there, there's a glow. Chicago author Jonathan Eig, a graduate of Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, has written the first comprehensive biography of King in three decades. There was a tidal wave of new information about King. Drawing on thousands of pages of transcripts from secret FBI recordings, more than 200 interviews, and new discoveries like tape recordings made by Coretta Scott King and an unpublished memoir by King's father, Ig's epic King A Life is being hailed by the New York Times as the definitive biography of the civil rights hero. Did you know that he attempted to commit suicide twice as a teenager? And did you know that he suffered depression most of his life? I felt like we needed a book. I wanted to read a book that helped me understand King as a person. I think this has been one of the great days of America. Ig ushers King off of the pedestal and back into the world of the living, breathing boy born in 1929. The name on King's birth certificate was Michael, after his father, Reverend Michael King Sr. But on a trip to Germany five years later, King's father was inspired by Martin Luther, the German monk who sparked the Protestant Reformation, and adopted the name for himself and his son. King Sr. was a powerful preacher and a domineering father. King had a difficult time standing up to his father, and all his life, really, he would have a hard time standing up to authority figures, which is a funny thing to say because he's our great protest leader. I cannot help thinking that a hundred years from now, the historians will be calling this not the peak generation, but the generation of integration. Such a big part of him really struggling to overcome his weaknesses, uh, knowing that he had to do the difficult things. And really all his life, he's doing the, the, the difficult things because he knows they're right, even if it's not easy. It's a trait King displayed on the eve of the Montgomery bus march. The, the injustices which we have experienced on the buses. He was just 26 years old when he was asked to speak. King became a founding father of the United States of America on December 5th, 1955. And I say that because in that moment, he stood up to, to say that we can fulfill the promises of the Constitution. We could bring this country closer to the promise of equal justice for all. He delivered a stirring speech that unlocked the genius of his oratorical skills, the ability to transcend his immediate audience. He said, if we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. I want to say to you once more that we... He became the leading figure in the civil rights movement and was viewed as a threat to the establishment in Washington. In 1963, the FBI, authorized by Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, into the fight against communism, began wiretapping his phone and bugging his motel and hotel rooms. At first, they were investigating because they feared King was plotting to align the civil rights movement with the Communist Party. Was that, in fact, the case? No, King was never interested in communism. He's one of our great patriots. He was trying to make this a more perfect union. But by the time they got to that conclusion, they had heard him on the phone with women, women other than Coretta. And he was clearly engaged in relationships with some of these women. And that became the obsession of the FBI. Why was his infidelity important enough to reauthorize wiretaps? I would say his infidelity was not important enough to reauthorize wiretaps. We of the FBI feel that we're a part of a team to make America a great and decent place in which to live. J. Edgar Hoover in particular thought that the civil rights movement posed a threat to the current order, to the power structure, to the white Christian nationalist power structure that he preferred. 
and he thought that King needed to be controlled and that the civil rights movement needed to be damaged. And it essentially would have undermined his status as this paragon of righteousness and morality. The FBI did undermine King's status as a leader. They spread the news to reporters all over the country and to other political leaders that King was a sinner, that he was a hypocrite, that he was cheating on his wife. Um, and they used that to try to weaken him. It worked. King's standing suffered, and so did his health. He was hospitalized numerous times, and, and he called it exhaustion, but now we would certainly describe it as depression. In fact, the day King was notified that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he was in an Atlanta hospital bed. The man most closely associated with hope, at times, felt hopeless. It was there for everybody to see, we just didn't really notice it at the time. King was under years-long surveillance by the FBI, which issued an extraordinary memo immediately after the I Have a Dream speech. And the next day, the FBI issues a memo saying, based on King's speech, given the power of his oratory, we must now consider him the most dangerous man in America when it comes to race. And they were throwing so many rocks and things. King would become more controversial in a speech entitled Beyond Vietnam, delivered exactly one year before his death, he denounced the war and challenged the president, demanding Americans think about inflicting pain abroad and tolerating poverty at home. People are forced to live in the most inhuman situations. It's uncomfortable, and why do we tend to forget that when we learn about him in school, that he was a radical figure who was demanding real change? One of the problems with teaching King in kindergarten and teaching him in sort of a simplified way throughout our education is that we stick to the safe stuff. Yes, we can all support voting rights. Yes, we can all support desegregation. Uh, racism is bad. But when you start talking about things like poverty, we have to help the poor. We have to help the hungry. And that's going to cost something. It's going to take something out of your pockets. We have to share. At the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, where King was assassinated in April of 1968, there is a memorial with a quote from the book of Genesis. It is the epigraph of Ig's book, too. They said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Let us slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. You forget that when he was assassinated, he was only 39 years old. It's stunning to think about how young he was. He's 12, 13 years younger than JFK when they're meeting at the White House. We think of JFK as being this very young president. King was a dozen years younger. So this is a very young man just feeling like he had to try. In the attempt, King made history. Ike argues we can't lose sight of his humanity. Because if we can't see him as a person, then we can't really follow in his footsteps. You can't ask anybody to become a leader, to take the risk of putting themselves out in front if they have to be perfect. In Evanston, Mike Lowe, WGN News.